The underlying principle for this series is a very simple observation. People are tired. I mean, like physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually exhausted. Because we live in this culture where we have so many demands. There's so much activity. We have so much to do, and we can't, we can't get it all done. And there's so much noise going on all the time. And so when I look around and maybe you do too, you see exhaustion. And yet Jesus says that if we follow him, somehow his life can and should flow into us. Like his passion and his power and his presence should infuse us. And here's what he says in John 15, 1 to 8. This is a passage we're looking at over several weeks. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him... He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples." This morning, I want to ask you to travel with me in your mind. Imagine that on a random day, okay, this coming year, probably fall or winter, you wake up and you go to work as usual. Like the alarm goes off and you have that, you know, like groggy haze and you desperately want to hit snooze, but you cannot afford to be late. So you, you fight your way out of bed. And as you make your way over to the shower, your mind is just flooded with all of the stress of, of work. And you think like, oh man, like here I go again. But as you pass by the window, brightness from the outside catches your eye. The light is reflecting off of, and you can't believe it because this was not predicted, but a sheet of snow. And it's beautiful. And so you stand at the window and you just stare. And as you gaze at the white stillness outside, you realize this is exactly what I needed, like a snow day. So you call into work and you say, not coming in. And then you crawl right back into bed. And you find that it is the most peaceful sleep you have had in a long time. You let go of all of your anxiety about work and you think to yourself, you know what? I'm not going to get up until, get this, I feel like it. And when you wake up and you feel like getting out of bed, you do. And immediately you start thinking of all these things that you, you should do like chores and, and housework and errands. But you say to yourself, like, you know what? This is a free day, dang it. I, I'm not going to do any of the stuff that I should do. I'm only going to do stuff today that I want to do. And you know what else? I'm not going to feel guilty about it. And so that's exactly what you do all day. You grab the kids and you call some friends and you go out and you play in the snow. And it is ridiculous. It's snow angels and snowmen and sledding. Now, normally you sit at a desk all day and so your body feels alive. And after a few hours, you've had enough. And so again, when you feel like it, you go in and you have hot chocolate with everybody. And in the afternoon, while the kids are napping, everyone else goes home and you decide to watch a movie that you've been wanting to see forever, and so you make some popcorn. And you sit down with your sexy spouse, and you hold hands, and you get lost in the movie and in each other. 
and you eat popcorn. This is my fantasy. That's where there's a lot of popcorn. <laughs> and it is insanely awesome. And the day just goes on and on like this until it's time for bed. And, and at night, you realize something. Like, you, you, you feel, like, refreshed. You're not exhausted like normal. Your spouse is talking to you about, like, stuff. But for whatever reason, today, it doesn't sound like the grown-ups aren't Charlie Brown. You just find yourself, like, riveted by the conversation. In fact, you feel energized in a deeper way than you can remember. It's like, you look back, you go, it was a great day. You just let go of stress, you let go of all the have-tos, and you did nothing but get-tos. And you think to yourself, man, like, I could use a snow day every week. Now, here's what I've noticed, okay? People are tired, man. Like, like, like in their bones. Because in our culture, we go and go and go. And, and for, for many people, there's this guilt that we feel if we ever stop. Like we feel this compulsion to be productive every second of every day. And the reality is for many people on the weekends, they're just as busy. There's, it's a different kind of production, but it's all about production. We've got all this stuff that has to be done. There's yard work and there's housework and there's errands and then there's more work. And then on Monday, guess what? It's back to work. And this goes on day after day, week after week. This got to produce. And in the end, we find ourselves feeling more and more drained. It's almost, when you think about it, it's almost as if the human machine was not designed to live like this. As if the engine is supposed to be turned off sometimes. Like if it isn't, it eventually starts to break down. Now, with that in mind, I want us to read some very ancient words. More than 3,000 years ago, these words shaped an entire nation. They shaped the nation of Israel. And these words helped set them apart as God's people. And so I'm going to read to you one of, one of the Ten Commandments. But before I do that, I, I want you to know that because of the sacredness and the significance of these words, certain communities over the last 2,000 years have practiced a custom that whenever the Ten Commandments would be read publicly, the entire assembly would stand together in reverence, okay? So I'm going to ask us to do that this morning. We're not a big up-down kind of church, but here we go. Stand up. Let's stand together in reverence for the reading of commandment number four. This is Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, you can be seated. Okay, now... This is one of the Ten Commandments. Let's, let's think together about what this is saying. This is essentially God commanding us to take a snow day every week. You guys, think about how ridiculously awesome that is. And just so we, we get like how serious God is and was about this, a um, little Bible trivia do you know what the punishment was in Israel for violating the Sabbath? Anybody? Death. It was the death penalty. Okay, listen to this. Exodus 35, 1 and 2. Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, okay, try imagine assembling the whole Israelite community. We're talking over a million people. And he said to them, these are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day. A day of Sabbath rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. 
You guys, like, God is dead serious about you and me getting recharged every week. And God wants there, apparently, to be a rhythm to our lives. Six days of production, six days of work, of fruitfulness, six days of, of unashamedly getting her done, and then one day free of work, okay, a snow day every week. Now, we were made to be fruitful. God created us to produce. There's something essential, like humanly essential and life-giving about accomplishing stuff. And without it, we discover that pretty soon life feels empty and it feels meaningless. But, but there can be this constant pressure, either from outside of ourselves or inside of ourselves, to, to just push harder, to work more, so that even when we're like not at work, there's this angst and we're not really at rest. I want to read to you the confession of a pastor named Mark Buchanan. He wrote a, a great book on Sabbath and on rest. And here's what he writes. He says, I became a Sabbath keeper the hard way. Either that or die. Not die literally, at least I don't think so, but die in other ways. It happened subtly over time. But I noticed at some point that the harder I worked, the less I accomplished. I was often a whirligig of motion. My days were intricately, intricately fitted together like the game of mousetrap. Every piece precariously connected to every other, the whole thing needing to work together for it to work at all. But there was little joy and stunted fruit. To justify myself, I'd tell others I was gripped by a magnificent obsession. I was purpose-driven, I said, or words like that. It may have begun that way, it wasn't that way any longer. Often I was just obsessed, merely driven, no magnificence of purposefulness about it. I once went 40 days, an ominously biblical number, without taking a single day off and was proud of it. But things weren't right. Though my work often consumed me, I was losing my pleasure in it, and for that matter, in many other things besides, and losing, too, my effectiveness in it. And here's the secret. For all my busyness, I was increasingly slothful. I could while away hours at a time in a masquerade of working, a pantomime of toil, fiddling about on the computer or leafing through old magazines or chatting up people in the hallways, but I was squandering time, not redeeming it. The inmost places suffered most. I grew easily irritable, paranoid, bitter, self-righteous, gloomy, I was often argumentative. I preferred rightness to intimacy. I avoided and withdrew. I had a few people I confided in, but few friends. And I don't know about you, I can relate to this. What he's saying here is so huge. He's saying he actually became less fruitful by working more. In learning to rest, he began to produce more fruit. To be fruitful... We have to rest. We have to get restored. In fact, you may have noticed this, like our bodies force us to do this. It's called sleep. I mean, like just imagine a person saying, you know what, I just, I got too much to do to sleep. So, so sometimes I stay up like, you know, five days at a time, just working. You know, I start with coffee and then I move to the more extreme stuff. Like by day three, I drink at least one rock star, one monster, and one Red Bull every hour. And, and when that stops working, then I, I crank up the ACDC Thunderstruck, get it blasting in my face. When that stops working, I have my wife come in and slap me every 10 minutes as hard as she crank across the face because I just got too much to do. I don't have time to sleep, man. Too much to get done. Now we look at that and we go, well, you know, uh, dude, that's not going to be an effective plan for more production. It's not going to lead to greater productivity. Why? Because you're going to crash or die. You got to have sleep. You got to have it like regularly, like at least a little bit every day. And if you don't get it, as you know, something terribly haywire happens. You can't produce. You can't produce anything. Your body just shuts down. Sleep is so necessary that defied too long, our, our bodies will eventually force the issue, right? Sleep eventually like hunts down every fugitive. 
It eventually catches you, and it has its way with you. But the Sabbath doesn't work like that. I mean, you can outrun it for a long, long time. You can spend most of your life running from the Sabbath and never figure out that this is in part why your work is unsatisfying, why you've lost passion and creativity, why you don't care about all the stuff you used to care about. You can avoid the Sabbath for most of your life and never realize this is why like, even my vacations are exhausting. This is why I have headaches all the time. This is why the passion that I once felt deeply, like passion for God, passion for causes, passion for people that I love, has, for whatever reason, it's gone cold. See, sleep will hunt you down, and it will eventually have its way with you. But the Sabbath will just watch you run for a long, long time. You can just be withering in your spirit, and just keep running. And you can add more and more to your plate. You can tell yourself, I have, I have way too much to do to rest. And there's a pretty serious delusion that contributes to all of this. It's the delusion that I'm God. That the weight of, of the world, at least my world, depends on me. That unless I push and pull and worry and watch all the time, somehow everything's going to fall apart. But as a follower of Jesus, there, there are at least two truths that, that govern my world. Okay, truth number one, there is a God. Truth number two, I am not him. And just so we can all, you know, get more clarity around this, just like turn to the person next to you and tell them, you are not God. hard for some of you to hear. <laughs> it's interesting because in Israel, this is how it worked. The Sabbath began on Friday night. You think about taking a day off. It began on Friday night. How weird is that? It began at sundown, okay, and then it ended at sundown on Saturday. So when you think about this, what's the very first thing that people did really with their Sabbath? They slept. And they slept. The first act of Sabbath was sleep. Now, sleep is like, as we know, it's necessary, but it's also, in a way, a step of faith. Because when we sleep, we actually set aside all power and control and, and consciousness. Like, we direct nothing while we sleep. We're the masters of, of nothing. In sleep, we become almost like, like infants again. We're vulnerable and, and defenseless. So, so sleep, besides being a necessity, is also in some ways an expression of faith. Um, in Psalm 3, David is being hunted by many enemies. He's like in constant danger all the time. And in verse 1, he cries out, he says, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? And yet in verse 5, he declares, I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. And in the next psalm, it says, In peace I will lay down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. So in part, we sleep because we rest in the hands of God. We're confident that he's able to keep what we're entrusting to him. That in sleep, we give ourselves, regardless of whatever our unfinished business is, into God's care. And we trust that our Father will look after us. Now, it's very similar when it comes to Sabbath rest. Because let's face it, I mean, your ultimate list of to-dos is, is endless, right? I, I, and either God is good and, and he's in control, or it all depends on you. And you think about it, it wasn't the circumstances of, of David that allowed him to rest. He, he literally is being hunted from all sides, never knows when it, an attack is coming. For him, his confidence was in God. In Psalm 62, 1 and 2, he says, Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Now, let's go back to the, to the words of God in commandment number four. 
It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work. And, and I want us to think a little bit about what this looks like, because I think, oh man, there's a ton of confusion around this. Like, what is the essence of, of Sabbath? Now, we're told we need to keep it holy. But what does that mean? Keep it holy. Does, that, does it mean that we can only do, like, God stuff for a whole day? Like, listen to sermons, or, or read the Bible, or pray, or meditate, or sing? Or does keeping it holy mean that we should, like, avoid sin on the Sabbath? I don't know. I'm pretty sure God wants us to avoid sin every day. So, so that wouldn't really need to be said. And, and, and when you envision it, when you envision it, maybe a day of nothing but Bible study, prayer, church, worship, singing doesn't exactly make your pulse race with anticipation. And maybe you go, what's wrong with me? Nothing. We need to think about what keeping it holy means. The, the, the word holy, first of all, what does that mean? The word holy simply means set apart. God is holy because he's set apart. He's set apart from sin. He's set apart from everything that isn't good and right and beautiful. And, and when it comes to the Sabbath being holy, okay, being set apart, what's being communicated, guys, is that it's different from other days. In other words, it should not look like the, the rest of the days of your week. It should be unique. It should be set apart. Now, should connecting with God be a part of it? Well, you bet. Okay, absolutely. But it's interesting because that's not actually what's emphasized in the commandment itself. What's, what's really emphasized there is the cessation of work, okay, of rest, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. And so the big question for 3,000 years as people have wrestled with this, of course, is, well, what constitutes work? And by Jesus' day, okay, they've now had like 1,000 years to think about this, the rabbis had taken this broad command and they had turned it into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rules. And the rules became so difficult to follow that they became this massive burden on the nation of Israel and on the people. And, and so what did Jesus do? Well, to make a point, he just kept walking around breaking Sabbath rules. I mean, Jesus is awesome. <laughs> and he's in this synagogue. And he's looking around at all the religious people and and knowing what will happen, and he heals somebody on the Sabbath. They're like, Jesus, you can't heal on, on the Sabbath. The religious people went nuts. That's work. That's work on the Sabbath. Jesus is like, really? Like if you had an animal fall into a pit, wouldn't you pull it out on the Sabbath? And they're like, well, sure we would. And he's like, how much more valuable is a person? In Mark 2, Jesus grabs a handful of grain as he walks through the field, and he knows the religious leaders are watching him. And again, they go berserk. The Pharisees are going berserk. They're like, Jesus, you're harvesting on the Sabbath. Really? Like a handful of grain? And Jesus intentionally does this stuff over and over to make a point. And, and after the, the incident with the grain, Jesus says, look, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay, in other words, the Sabbath is God's gift to you. Because you desperately need it. It's not supposed to be a big, fat burden, like another chore for you to do. It should be free and joy-filled. It should be something that restores and refreshes, something that you can't wait to get to, something that you actually would look forward to all week. So here's a, 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 de a definition that I think gets to the heart of this. What is Sabbath? Essentially, there's, there's two parts to it. Number one, Part one, we cease from what is necessary. And part two is embrace that which gives life. And I look at that and go, you think about how freeing that is. Uh, again, Pastor Mark Buchanan, he, he puts it like this. He says, Sabbath is a complete and total reprieve 
from what you ought to do, even though the list of oughts is infinitely long and never done. Oughts are tyrants, noisy and surly, chronically dissatisfied. Sabbath is the day that you trade places with them. They go in the salt mine, and you go out dancing. It's the one day when the only thing you must do is not do the things you must. You are given permission, issued a command to be blunt, to turn your back on all those oughts. So, okay, can I chop wood on the Sabbath? It depends, see? If it's something that I must do, something I feel obligated to do, then I'm not going to do it because it smells like an ought. But maybe I, I chop wood for the sheer exhilaration of it. Maybe it makes me feel alive and manly. <laughs> maybe it puts the, the good kind of ache in my muscles that, frankly, don't get used enough. I mean, maybe if my job is to sit in front of a computer all day long, then doing something physically would actually be restorative for me. How about mowing the lawn? Okay, or weeding the flower bed? Same deal. Does it smell like an ought? Okay, or would it restore me? How about shopping? Never. It is always, always wrong on the Sabbath to go shopping. <laughs> As human beings, we like to put rules on things that don't necessarily need rules. And I, I was at a, a gathering of pastors several years ago, and we were talking about this topic, and um, the head guy sort of leading the discussion said, very reverently and piously, I might add, I don't think it is restorative to engage in electronic entertainment on the Sabbath. TV, video games, that kind of junk. I think it's better to embrace nature, get outside. And I was like, okay, now I can see the point. I mean, I get the point, but, but that is just way too rigid. And so I... I couldn't help myself because I do this when I get in past, like pastor gatherings. I do these things. I raised my hand and said, it, it seems like you're saying that it would be wrong for, say, me and my son to watch a Mariners game on TV on the Sabbath on account that it's on TV. Do you think it'd be okay if we bought tickets and physically went? And he was not very happy with my question. <laughs> and it got awkward in the room. But I was just like, really? Sir, come on, man, really? Like banning all electronics? That just feels completely unnecessary to me. Sure, we should be aware of, of, of what we're doing. And so for me, I, I don't have a rule like that. But I'll tell you what, I like nature. Uh, I like getting outside and experiencing God's creation. I, when it's nice out, many of you know, Jen and I will try to go for like really historically long walks. We, I, last summer, I think we got up to like 14 miles and we were doing that fairly regularly. Or we'll take the kids out to, to Green Lake or we'll hang out at, at Silver Lake, you know, maybe go for a hike or hang out at the beach or we might even mow the lawn, do some landscaping if that feels like fun and exciting. Like, we like getting outside. We like nature. We might go as a family to a Mariners game. But I also, just so you guys know, I like baseball on TV. Dang it. <laughs> and <clears throat> it's a whole lot cheaper. So here's like a really, really important thing. Nothing will suck the life out of your Sabbath experience faster than unnecessary legalistic rules about it. Okay, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Now, I know, there are all kinds of questions that, that, that come up and haven't really been addressed. Stuff like, okay, well, does the Sabbath have to be on a Sunday? Like, what, what if my schedule at work or my life circumstances, you know, prevents that sometimes? Or... How is going to church and serving at church and engaging in church activities, how does that fit into the whole concept of Sabbath? 
Because, like, isn't that work? Or, or if, if I'm a full-time mom, okay, and my, my work is to raise small kids every day, then how in the world is a Sabbath day any different? Or should I try to spend most of my Sabbath with, like, other people? You know, like, find, or should I, like, you know, like, find, find, should I try and find some quiet space and try to do, it like, a solitary thing? But where does, where does prayer and interaction with, with Scripture fit in? I mean, I know there's, there's room for just plain fun, but, but isn't connecting with Jesus, like, also important? Or if I take a risk and I watch the Mariners and they lose on the Sabbath, <laughs> will it destroy my soul and waste hours of my time? And these are really important questions. Um, and so this leaves us a whole lot of stuff to talk about in coming weeks. Um, but I want us to get our minds this morning around the importance of resting. I want us to get our minds, at least begin to get our minds around how resting fits in with abiding. How resting and, and, and abiding actually enable us to do more work, to be more fruitful. And so I want to talk quite a bit more about the spiritual side of resting and abiding. Okay, about actually connecting with Jesus as a part of abiding, as a part of Sabbath, as a part of, of, of our whole rhythm of rest and work and, and abiding. But I have decided to not try to delve into too much of that today. I am discovering that when it comes to sermons, less is more. So uh, I had this whole plan of stuff I was going to get into as I was thinking about this all week, and then I realized you guys don't want to be here until 4 o'clock, so... <laughs> I'm going to keep it simple today, and I'm just going to wrap up with this. For me and, and for Jen, Sabbath has become a huge part of our life. And um, as most of you know, many of you know very well, Sunday isn't really our day. It isn't really a down day for us. And so we, what we do is we set aside every Monday, like every Monday, and on Mondays, we, we avoid anything that smells like what we do the rest of the week, okay, which is church. So we actually avoid church on the Sabbath. Uh, we avoid church-related texts, church-related emails, phone calls. Um, now, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to. As people who love us, if you love us, and you have questions about church, um, when do you think of those? You think of them on Sunday night and Monday morning. And so I would just say, please, 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 send those questions to us whenever you feel like it, even if it's four in the morning, but, but do it through email on Sunday, Monday. Um, because we can avoid our email. We often are discovering we can't avoid our texts. We have too many things that, that are coming in and out with our kids and stuff. We can't avoid those, and we see them. And then we read them to each other, and then we start talking about them. And we start cursing your name. <laughs> so I'm just, okay, just a plea. Um, no, just kidding. That's, no, that's, that's serious. Because we're off. That's our day off. You know, I'm not going to call you with work stuff on your day off. I'm just telling you right now I won't. Um, and so we, we try to avoid all that stuff. And then what we try to do is just fill our day with stuff we like to do, stuff we want to do, stuff we haven't been able to do. And I love it, man. I love it. I look forward to it. I, I mean, I love Sundays, and I love, I love Tuesday through Saturday and prepping for Sundays and just doing ministry and doing life and serving, serving you guys and serving people and teaching and prepping and all of that stuff. I love church. I love being with you guys. I love meeting new people. I love worshiping together, okay? But man, do I look forward to Mondays, like snow days, okay? Total permission to not have to produce anything. Now, if every day was, was Monday, life would get purposeless in a hurry, because I also very much need Tuesday through Saturday, okay? I got to have it through Sunday. But I can't tell you how much I love Mondays and how much over the years I've grown to love Mondays. And Jen and I 
for us, we've discovered we like we, we have to really carve that day out. We have to we have to protect it because it's amazingly easy to fill it up with all kinds of oughts. They just come up. And here's the thing. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we look at stuff. We go, okay, well, I want underwear, so we're going to do some laundry. But, but that was a random example that came to me in the moment. I could have I found a better example. I apologize if anyone is, if the imagery is. I, but the, the oughts come up, okay? And... Uh, and it, and it can happen in a hurry. And, and so what, what happens, we've discovered this, is if we, we allow Monday to be about all of the oughts, within a week or two, we feel it. Like there's no passion for life. We lose creativity. We start like hating people. We, we just, uh, just kid, not that time I was just kidding. We don't hate people. But the love gets dialed down a little bit. And if we don't em- embrace and protect our snow day, we feel it. And I look at this stuff and I go, you know, from my own personal experience, it's kind of like, it feels like God knows what he's doing. Like, like a Sabbath is actually essential for human flourishing. And like I said, I know there's a lot of questions around this. I know that you have stuff buzzing through your head on this. But I just want to close with this. God is offering a snow day to you every week. He's inviting, he's inviting you into it. It is, it is his gift to you. And, and the reality is, many of you, you may need this far more than you realize. And my question is, will you begin to process this and think about it and begin to take action on it as you, as you understand more about it? Will you receive it and enter into it and experience it? And then will you protect it and guard it and embrace it? Will you will you trust, okay, in this in the midst of a sea of of all these to-dos, that man, God's got you. That despite all of the oughts on your list, all the ought tos, God's actually calling you to spend a whole day, imagine this, a whole day every week on the get tos. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. 